Hey there, welcome to Geeky Greenhouse. In today's video, I'll talk all about habits that kill soil health. There are countless myths and recommendations on the internet for how to properly treat your soil, but many of them don't seem to be backed by actual scientific evidence. So in this video, I'll talk all about some habits that have been proven to be harmful to soil. Now, these are definitely gonna be a bit controversial. I know some of these habits are very common. Most people perform some of these on a regular basis, so I'll definitely talk through each of them thoroughly and provide resources for you to follow up on if you want some more information. Before I get into the habits that are harmful to soil, let's talk about what makes up healthy soil. An ideal soil is both well aerated and also has plenty of channels to absorb water and to retain that water and deliver it to plants. Soil aggregates that are basically clumps of soil that hold together well should be visible in a soil sample. Healthy soil is also full of biota or microbes and other living organisms that create a large amount of diversity in the soil, leading to higher resiliency to pests and disease. Healthy soil should also have around 5% organic matter, which feeds the biota in the soil and also nourishes your plant's roots. Healthy soil should also have living roots growing in it as frequently as possible, ideally all the time. And that soil should be covered in one way or another by either mulch or a living crop like a cover crop. Now there are many different types of soil. Your actual soil structure is likely to differ very much from mine, but regardless of the sand, silt, and clay levels in your soil, your soil can still be healthy as long as it has these properties. So let's get into the first habit that is damaging to soil health, and this is definitely a controversial one, and that would be tilling. First off, what is tilling? Tilling is the process of cultivating or turning over the soil to reduce weeds and to improve soil tilth for planting. Now this technique, of course, goes back for centuries. It's a very common way to get rid of some weeds and to sort of fluff up the soil in anticipation of planting. But what does tilling actually do to the soil? First off, tilling can break up aggregates or clumps of soil, which reduces water infiltration into the soil and can also lead to crusting over on the surface. Tilling also harms biological life, such as macroinvertebrates that live in the soil, and can also reduce beneficial fungi in the soil like mycorrhiza. Tilling can also reduce surface residue, such as plant material from a previous crop year, which feeds things like earthworms. Tilling also brings dormant weed seeds up to the surface, allowing them to germinate and leading to more weeding. And tilling just generally degrades the soil structure over time. So if you're used to tilling your garden every year, don't panic, but consider making some changes and doing these things instead. First off, avoid rototillers. They are the worst culprit when it comes to tilling because they basically mix up the soil very aggressively, heightening all the disadvantages. If you primarily use tilling to kill off weeds, you can use other techniques like solarization or by using a rake when weed seedlings are just emerging. If your soil is compacted and you're looking to fluff it up to plant your seeds, consider just forking the soil rather than turning it over entirely. A gentle forking with a broad fork or even just a pitch fork to loosen up the soil but not completely turn it over and mix it is a much better option. And lastly, and you'll hear this a lot during this video, provide some organic matter like compost to improve the soil's overall structure. The next habit that may be killing your soil health is not covering your soil. The main reason for this is that not covering soil can lead to erosion of the soil, which is most commonly caused by rain droplets falling directly onto the soil's surface, breaking up those all important soil aggregates and eventually leading to the topsoil potentially washing away. Essentially, uncovered soil is very vulnerable to the elements, especially during the rainier seasons or over the winter. One example of this is the Dust Bowl in the 1930s. It can largely be attributed to poor soil maintenance, leading to erosion, combined with severe drought conditions. A couple other things that can lead to erosion besides leaving the soil uncovered include things like working your soil if it's clay rich and especially when the soil is wet and having a lack of living things growing in the soil. It makes a lot of sense if you think about when you pull a plant out of a planter and the root ball is holding together all of the soil. The same thing happens in in-ground soil. The roots sort of hold together the soil, making it a lot harder for that soil to wash away. So how do you prevent soil erosion? The obvious one is cover your soil up when it's not in use. And even when it is in use, cover up the soil with a natural mulch, which will provide a number of other benefits too. Another great option is to plant cover crops in the off seasons and on the shoulder seasons. Again, when your garden isn't in use, these cover crops provide a number of benefits, not just preventing erosion, but also fixing nitrogen into the soil and providing some great green materials to add to your compost pile. 
You can also leave some crop residue in place at the end of the season. Fallen leaves and branches and even the roots of your plants can be left underneath the soil to help hold the soil together and prevent that erosion. But by and large, the most important thing you can do is cover up that soil. Even if you use a tarp, it's much better than leaving the soil bare when it's not in use. The next habit that is harmful to your soil health is compacting the soil. So what is compaction? Compacted soil is essentially more dense than healthy soil, leading to poor water and air penetration. This is basically the opposite of soil aggregates, which are visibly porous, allowing plenty of air and water into the soil. So what are some habits that can cause compaction? Walking on your soil or driving heavy machinery on your soil, especially when it's wet, is the easiest way to wind up with compacted soil. If the soil is rich in clay, you especially want to avoid disturbing the soil at all when it's wet, as this can easily collapse those soil aggregates leading to compaction. Now it can be hard to know if you have compacted soil, especially if it's happening deeper underneath the surface soil. And one of the easiest ways to test this is using a wire flag. In late spring or during the summer months after the soil has warmed up, insert the flag directly down into the soil and see if it starts to bend before reaching the bottom. This would indicate a hard layer of soil somewhere underneath the surface, meaning that the roots of your plants may have difficulty growing beyond that point in the soil. Make sure you're testing in multiple locations to make sure you're not just hitting a rock or something like that. But if you find that you do have compacted soil, here are some things you can do. Compacted soil may be a good reason to actually till your soil just one time. If you're starting a new in-ground bed and you find that the soil is heavily compacted, you may need to break up that soil in order to condition it for the future. Planting deep-rooted crops such as oilseed radish can help break up deeper compaction below the surface. And again, avoid walking or driving heavy machinery across your garden. Make sure that you've defined clear walking paths and use them and never step on your garden beds. Lastly, to avoid compaction in the future, you should add some organic matter to your gardens like compost or manure, which improves biological diversity, ultimately helping resist compaction in the future. Another habit that may be killing your soil health is only using synthetic fertilizer. Now, firstly, I wanna say that synthetic fertilizer alone will not kill your soil microbes. In fact, this is a very common misunderstanding. Both synthetic and organic fertilizers will help feed the microbes in the soil, but chemical fertilizers fail to improve the soil's health over time. Organic materials, especially those that are bulkier like compost and manure, will do a better job of improving the microbial life in the soil, but will also add structure to your soil, improving water retention and airspace in the soil. Now, the great thing about compost and manure is that it will improve whatever type of soil you have. So if your soil doesn't drain well and it's rich in clay, adding compost will help it drain better. And if your soil is especially sandy like ours is and drains a little bit too well, adding organic material will sort of act like a sponge holding on to more water and more nutrients. Also, if you're only using synthetic fertilizer, it's very easy to overapply your nutrients, which can easily lead to runoff into your local streams and rivers, eventually leading to algae blooms in lakes and ponds, which can damage your local fish populations. So I definitely don't want to discourage you from using synthetic fertilizers. By all means, if you've been using it for years and you like it, that's completely up to you. But I would recommend getting a soil test so that you can understand exactly what's already in your ground soil so that you're not adding an overabundance of any one nutrient. A soil test will tell you exactly what's in the soil, the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. It'll also tell you the percentage of organic matter that's in your soil, as well as the pH of the soil and the structure, so how much sand, silt, and clay is in the soil. Then you can be much more methodical about how much of any one nutrient you're adding. Usually you'll need to add nitrogen and not so much phosphate or potassium. So in an ideal world, what I would recommend doing instead of using just synthetic fertilizers is adding bulky organic material like compost and manures to your soil, which will improve the structure and tilth, but also feed the biota in the soil, the microbes, and the larger organisms, leading to increased diversity in the soil and a much more robust resiliency to pests and disease. It also helps form those all-important soil aggregates, which act as a sponge for water and nutrients, which ultimately leads to less runoff and better retention in the soil to grow healthier plants. So to summarize this video, I wanna give three basic recommendations to keep your soil healthy. Number one, minimize soil disturbance by reducing or stopping tilling altogether, avoiding walking or driving over your soil, especially when it's wet, and keeping the soil covered with mulch to prevent erosion. 
Number two, increase biodiversity by adding organic materials like compost, manures, and other organic sources, interplanting a variety of different crops in the same growing area, and reducing the use of pesticides which can harm beneficial soil organisms. And number three, keep living root systems in your soil as often as possible by planting cover crops when your garden isn't in use during the off season and planting perennial crops wherever possible. I hope this video helps you make some positive changes in your garden, leading to healthier soil and ultimately healthier plants. Again, there'll be some resources linked down in the description so you can learn more about soil health and the things you can do to keep your garden happy. Thanks so much for watching Geeky Greenhouse and I'll see you next time.